Talo Falava, kia ora koutou and welcome to another episode of Playmakers where every week we sit down with some of our past and present superstars of rugby. Today I have the pleasure of sitting down with a man that's played 139 games for the Blues, 81 test matches for the All Blacks including two winning Rugby World Cups and still at the age of, tender age should I say, of 38, Jerome Kainoa. Bonjour Jerome, ça va? Bonjour, talo folks. How are you, bro? Uh, what, what have you been up to, man? Are you, uh, have, you, have you recovered from um, the last couple of weeks of uh, celebrations, shall I say? <laughs> uh, barely, but uh, yeah, our celebrations were short-lived. We had to get back to training on Tuesday for our uh, last round-robin game. But uh, yeah, it's been a busy month or so, uh, heading into the... Uh, to the business end of the season, but um, yeah, it's starting to heat up over here, so uh, getting exciting. Yeah, when you say business end, also, I mean, yeah, you've just you know, had the European Cup, you've just finished that, you've won that title, but now you've, you're back into the top 14 up against um, you know, Bordeaux. You know, you're preparing for that, that semi final this, this weekend. I mean, uh, how, do, how do the French sides see that? Because you often hear that the, they find the top 14 more important than, than the European Cup. Is that still the case? No, I don't think it's been the case for Toulouse for the past uh, 10 or 12 years. I think they really put some importance on the European Cup and the top 14, but uh, probably because they know how hard it is to win the European title uh, and the, the competition you come up against. But uh, but also the history that Toulouse have with, uh, with their cup, um, yeah, we, we put a big focus on both competitions and uh, yeah, lucky that our, the plan that our coaches and our club put in place for the European Cup uh, came to fruition this year and we were able to win the fifth title for the club, which has uh, been huge. But for us foreigners, we found it really hard to to get to a final and then win it and have this big celebration and realise that you've got to back up to training on, uh, on Tuesday and then look head into another competition because usually you have a final and then that's it yeah you put the feet up but uh wasn't the case this time which was quite weird so how, how was that then i mean you said you had to go back to, to training on on tuesday that you had a few days off because you know obviously you, you've been there before in, in new zealand um you know the frenchies also they love to celebrate their achievements how mm. hard is it to come down to then you know, in a, in a few days' time, get yourself, you know, mentally prepared, but uh, but also, you know, physically after what was a hard game. Yeah, it's, uh, it was pretty tough, uh, to be honest, to get to training on Tuesday and to refocus. But, um, you know, the coaches, are, our coaches and, and our president, they're really good at motivating the boys. And <clears throat> one good thing about our club is that you walk around and on the walls uh, are plastered the, the golden years of the of the club when they won uh, top 14 European titles and, and you see a lot of the legends holding up the cups in one of those uh, seasons where they did the double where they did the top mm. 14 and the, and the European title which uh, a lot of the script that I'm part of right now are quite motivated to do so and while on one hand it was hard to turn up to training on that Tuesday but then, uh, then again at the beginning of the season we set up set out a plan to to do the impossible and that was the, to get the double. Uh, I mean, this is, I mean, for a lot of Kiwis here, they don't really understand how difficult this competition is because they both play, you know, side by side. You know, you're playing the European, but also the, the, the top four, you know, 27 odd games, you know, th throughout the whole whole season. This is something different and, and, and very difficult thing to be able to, to be able to do. I mean, how, how have you adjusted to that sort of, um, I suppose, um, you know, new competition. Because usually in New Zealand, we just go, you know, straight weeks and then you have a final and then yeah. you move on to something different. This here is just a, it's a big ask, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty tough. But I think for a, from a player's perspective, it's uh, it's, exciting, it's the exciting part. I think for the coaches and uh, the staff, it's probably a headache for them to, to try and pick a, a squad big enough and competitive enough to be able to compete in both competitions. But uh, for me, coming from the Southern Hemisphere, it was quite refreshing uh, playing top 14 for a couple of years, but then also playing a different brand of rugby and playing different teams from uh, Ireland and, uh, and England. 
the, the different brands and the different styles that they play. And for me, I, I kind of enjoyed that. But uh, I think it's more the the attrition, the if you can keep up with it. And uh, at my young age, it uh, <laughs> probably wasn't realistic this year to, to play back-to-back uh, uh, games on top 14 and, and European Cup. So I've been lucky that the coaches have been uh, kind enough to, to monitor my my minutes and my game time, which has been good. Well, I mean, you, you talk about that. I mean, you're, I mean, you're 38 years old. I mean, you, you turned up there in 2018, and you really touched a little bit about the history of the club. But it wasn't really in uh, in sort of the Easter year days then back then, was it? I mean, they, they came 12th in 2017. What's what sort of happened? You know, what's 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 allowed them to make that change to get to you guys back to this level to the, to where it was? You know, you know, back in the days when they were so, um, I suppose, you know, dominant. Hmm. I think uh, I think the club had uh, really they've, uh, they've bred some really good younger players come through the academy system, but they've also recruited a lot of uh, uh, French rugby's. Uh, uh, up-and-coming stars with uh, Antoine Dupont mm. and uh, a lot of the other younger guys were Roman Intermac who came yeah. through the academy system here as well. But um, I think those uh, those years where they came in 12th and then lost in the quarterfinal, uh, I think there was just a, a matter of time that they were going to click. I think they needed those years to, to try and gel those uh, combinations, get the younger players a bit of game time at, at the top level, get a bit of confidence in I feel like I'm the lucky one that uh, I came in at the right time where everything just started clicking for these youngsters and, and the team and we were able to win a top 14 in my first year, which uh, uh, was amazing. Tell us about those two, those guys you mentioned, DuPont and Intermec. Like, I, I remember Intermec as, well, his father, really. You're probably a little bit too young, man. You were probably still in your nappies when his father was, you know, running around here yeah. carving up in, in New Zealand. But... I mean, the, the shape of the, those youngsters, particularly in France now, and in, in the future of the French rugby, man, it must be so exciting at the moment. Yeah, it's uh, really exciting. And to, to name those two, uh, they remind me of uh, like the Rico Ioannis, the Damian McKenzie's of yeah. New Zealand rugby. They just, uh, they're not afraid of anything. They just want to get out there and play and show show what they've got. Uh, no reservations in terms of what, or what, uh, pressures like they just want to get out there and play and for our team to have uh, young leaders like that at, in important positions it's uh, it's quite amazing and it's definitely the key to to why Toulouse is doing so well because uh, we've got young uh, young players with a uh, great head on their shoulders that just want to get out there and lead the team and play well. I mean, you throw in a few, you know, other overseas boys like yourself, Charlie and uh, Fatmoina there, and Peter Aki, you know, Colby coming from from South Africa. That must must have been quite comforting for you to have sort of that, uh, you know, southern hemisphere feel about it as well. Yeah, no, it's great to to reconnect with a couple of the brothers, uh, Charlie, Peter, Joe Takori. But oh, uh, Joe, Joe, Joe is he still going? <laughs> yeah, uh, Joe's still got a couple more years in him. He's uh I don't think he's missed the training in two years. Oh. Uh, still runs around like a young buck while uh, <laughs> while I'm I'm hugging the physio beds in the in the physio room. <laughs> so he's doing really well. But uh, yeah, it's great to have the uh, connection with some of the South African boys and Australian boys as well. Uh, to uh, you know, to, to add a bit of flavour to to the team. So to t- tell us about what Chislin brings, man, because you know all we've seen is you know what he can what he can do on the field is there. I mean, what do you? I mean, I know you've played with a lot of special players and uh, some X Factor guys, but what do you rate up there as you know one of the best um, that you've played played with? Yeah, he's he'll be definitely up there with uh, one of the best uh, wingers or the best individual players that I've ever played with. Uh, just what what he can do every game. He he does something every game, and uh, his feet uh, are amazing. But uh, one thing that people underestimate about him is uh, he, he's small, but he's he's pretty strong for his size. He punches well above his weight in terms of physicality and what he can do. But uh, yeah, it's, um, definitely grateful that these knees don't have to try and figure out which side he's going to step uh, that he's on my side uh, I'm quite lucky um, you know you, you spoke about the style um, 
there's no doubt they love the physicality, and, and we we often pride ourselves in the physicality here in uh, in New Zealand as well. But it's a different type of physicality over there, isn't it? I mean, um, you know, they focus a lot on making sure you're you're really dominant, particularly around the ruck areas. And then I suppose the weather, when it's you know yeah, it's a, probably a little bit slower. Uh, did, did that you know aid you in some way in terms of the stuff that you you know love to do? You love you know hitting bodies and um and, and cleaning rucks and things like that, and then hurting and putting guys backwards. Yeah, oh, I, I found it kind of similar to Super Rugby, but uh, there are definitely some bigger bodies over here uh, moving around. Uh, I think coming over here, you're able to carry a, a few extra kilos because when, when in the winter, the game's definitely a lot slower than uh, what we used to at Super Rugby level. But uh, yeah, the contacts uh, definitely take its toll. Uh, I do love the physical side of it, but uh, I found that... Uh, I had to definitely carry a couple more kilos on me to, to be able to uh, keep up with the, with the contact. But, yeah, well, it's, uh, the, the, the contacts are tough. It's not really the, the, the contacts in the game. It's more the grind during the week and yeah. how long the season is. That's, that's what uh, takes its toll. So, so when you say a couple of more kilos, do they emphasise a bit more in the gym? Do, are they in there in the gym putting on a couple more kgs or... Are you down at KFC putting on yeah. that that sort of weight? No, they're, they're really similar to what we what we used to in New Zealand. It's uh, it's case by case what the player what the player is at its be, at his best. If uh, if you perform better, with, if you're being a bit lighter, then uh, they, they'd rather you do that and, and be efficient on the field. But uh, if you feel that you're at your best carrying a little bit more and, and be more effective in the contacts, then. Uh, they'll prescribe something for you in, in the gym uh, to to aid that. But, uh, yeah, uh, I don't think they blanket everyone and say everyone needs to uh, put on a couple of kilos because uh, yeah, it's a bit unrealistic. <laughs> um, it's been a tough couple of seasons, uh, years, I suppose, in terms of the pandemic and things like that. We're very yeah. fortunate here in New Zealand that things have, have opened up. But life over in, in Europe has been a lot different in terms of you know the lockdowns that you've had and... Um, how have you had to, you know, you know yourself and Di and the kids in there, especially, you know, in, in, on the home front? How have you had to adapt to, to that aspect of um, of life? I I kind of enjoyed uh, going into lockdown here. Um, when we, I think we we stayed home for about, I think it was two or three months. I, I enjoyed the family time. It was uh, it was kind of the first time I'd been home for a very long time, for for that stretch. Uh, being being a rugby player for ten or so years and, and being on the road here and there, it was kind of good to to know that you were going to constantly be home for a certain period where you could uh, spend some time with the kids and seeing what other people had to struggle with around the world in terms of losing jobs and uh, livelihoods, some people losing their lives. So I think uh, we we considered ourselves lucky that. All we needed to do was uh, stay at home and spend time with loved ones, which is uh, which is quite easy. But uh, we really enjoyed it. The kids really loved uh, being home and uh, do a bit of homeschooling. And uh, we were lucky the weather started to pick up and it was it was, a, it was warmer when uh, we went into lockdown. So it was uh, it was good. I, I found it really enjoyable. I'm glad to hear that. Also, I mean, uh, in saying that, also, I mean, with everything going on and the uncertainty around around the world particularly around also the rugby players as well. Was there ever, mm. did, you ever, did it ever cross your mind to think far out, perhaps we should go back home to New Zealand and, um, and, and, and finish up? Well, uh, we, we always got reassured by the club that there would be a time we would uh, uh, recommence the season. But uh, yeah, there's always, there was always that uncertainty. But uh, yeah, it did cross our mind a bit where we, we thought uh, if it continues for a longer period of time, then maybe maybe we do uh, head back home and, and uh, get the kids back into school. But um, no, uh, not long after we were in lockdown for a period, then we, we started training again and then things started to pick up. But uh, yeah, but, uh, I'm not going to lie, it did cross our mind, but uh, uh, didn't eventuate in terms of actually planning it. What, what does that look like now too? Lorms, the fact you know what what are precautions like? I mean, it's possibly very different when you go to the games, go to trainings. You know, what's what's what sort of things do you guys, 
you know, have to do in terms of these masks, the, uh, you know, they're not allowed any contact with any, anyone else. I mean, what does that look like? Because that must be you know, a difficult adjustment as well when you're, when you're trying to think about the game itself, but also the precautions around COVID. Yeah, so, yeah, obviously masks are mandatory to wear around the facilities. We used to have, uh, every day was an open training where the public could come and just watch uh, wow. any session they wanted on the field. And uh, so that's all stopped and we have barriers around around the club where, where, where we wouldn't have to come into contact with uh, uh, the public. Um, uh Obviously, no no crowds at uh, games, but uh, at the moment we're getting uh, COVID tests on Monday mornings, Wednesday mornings, and Friday mornings now. <clears throat> which is uh, all right. How's the nostrils, bro? Which is getting. Oh, I know. It's, uh, <laughs> we should be getting used to it, but uh, no, nah, uh, I could never get used to that. But it's uh, yeah, it's, it's it's improving though because. Uh, here in France, the restaurants are starting to open. People are starting to to mingle around town where they're relaxing the, the rules a little bit. But uh, probably a couple of months ago, everything had to shut at 6 p.m. And, and no one was allowed to walk around in the streets or, or mingle around in groups, um, which uh, perfect timing for summer. And, that, and that's, that's a difficult thing because French people love interacting and getting around. But even the greetings, you know, when you know, they kiss... You know yeah. each other and that. Does that sort of stuff had to had to stop as well, or they they they're still pretty passionate about that, the way they greet people? No, they had to stop. It's uh, it's uh, strictly fist bumps at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Um, this week, I, I want to talk about you know your preparations this week against um, you know Bordeaux. You know, there's obviously a couple of other Kiwi guys um, in, in their their team. Have you, have you had any contact with those boys? Because, you know, I know every now and then you bump into a few of the, the brothers overseas and, yeah, you tend to catch up. But have, have you had any contact with the guys coming into this uh, week's game? Yeah, we uh, we played them a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's good to catch up with a couple of the boys there. Um, ben Lamb, Ben Tabafuna, Ben Bodica, uh, and a couple of Aussie boys that are there as well. But, um, yeah, it's an interesting one this week. I think both teams know each other really well. This is going to be the fourth time that we've played uh, uh, Bordeaux this season because we played them two twice in the top 14 and then we played them in the semi-final for the European Cup and then now again semi-final in the top 14, which uh, I think both teams will know each other pretty well uh, come this weekend, but uh, everything's just going to amplify because it's a semi-final and uh, uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be a good clash. Lawrence, I want to um, have a, I suppose, quick yarn about you know your time in Japan. Um, you know now it's all sort of it's it's common now that guys are going over there and, yeah. and playing over there, and, you, and your your experience over there as well. Did that, in, in some ways, you know the the, the physic, physical nature of it, it wasn't as physical as you did. Do you think that prolonged your career? And did did you enjoy it? What was life in Japan like for you over there playing for Toyota? Sure, oh, I loved I loved my time in Nagoya. Uh, yeah, definitely look back at it as uh, uh, well, it was a lot of fond memories. Uh, yeah, you're right. I definitely think it uh, added or gave me a few more years uh, on my career. Uh, one, because the game, the game in Japan at that time wasn't as physical, but uh, they did a hell of a lot of running. <laughs> um, which, uh, if, if you know me, I'm not I'm not at the front uh, of the group when it comes to this time. But I think it was great for me for uh, in terms of family time, uh, but uh, to not actually smash up the body a bit. And it was perfect timing after the 2011 World Cup to be able to get over there, refresh a little bit, uh, play some different rugby, learn a different culture. But uh, uh, my time over there, I realised how much I missed New Zealand rugby and how much I missed the black jersey, and gave me that time to work. I worked pretty hard while I was over there, and able was able to come back and still hit some form for the Blues and make it back into the All Blacks. But uh, yeah, you're right. I, I think it definitely did uh, prolong my career uh, to a certain extent. How, how have you found that, Wolf? Like, I mean, 20 years, man. You're, uh, you're playing, you know, professional rugby. I mean. You know, you've been an All Black for 81 yeah. tests, you know, a, a, a heck of a long time. How was that transition when you sort of, 
finally went to France and thought, man, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be an All Black again. I mean, did it, did it, did it take a wee while to, to get used to, or is it still something you think about that? Hey, man, that the, you know the All Blacks, um, how special that was. Oh, I think once I left uh, for France, once I left New Zealand for France, I uh, I was at peace with not being an All Black again. I I knew that I wasn't uh, playing competitive enough rugby to to fight for a position, and I knew the younger guys that were coming through were pretty hot. So uh, uh, for me, I knew the jersey and the, the team were in good hands and. Uh, I'd been pretty, I was pretty proud of what I had achieved in the black jersey and in that environment and, well, and in New Zealand as well. So uh, for me, it was about uh, setting another challenge and making sure that I didn't just come to France to, as a, you know, like a retirement scheme in terms of <laughs> uh, just coming over here and putting my feet up. Yeah. I really wanted to still challenge myself and be competitive and, and play the best rugby I could as I could. And I suppose when you say competitive as well, you haven't quite finished yet. You still got some big games left in you. But what does you know? You know, life after um, you know is, is, it, is it a mentorship role? Are you, the academy there is very strong, and a lot of you guys have come through the academy. Are you looking to take you know time in there to to, to help others? Because you've, you've always been a person that's done that. You know, giving back to the younger guys. Is a coaching role in terms of the academy something that you'll be looking forward to? Yeah, um, I'm definitely looking forward to working with the academy here. Um, I've done bits and bobs with them for the past year or so and uh, seen how they operate and, what, and how I could uh, fit into the, into the system uh, best, as best as possible. But, uh, yeah, it would be more like a mentorship role, uh, skills, uh, forward skills role. But um, I've I've got a couple of my world rugby certificates, but uh, <laughs> uh, the French they uh, they they do their own certificates. So uh, <laughs> while I'm working with the academy, I'll be uh, I'll be getting assessed and uh, going to try and get my French certificates. So uh, and during the summer, it's not going to be a holiday. I have to try and pick up on my French lessons and <laughs> and uh, and uh, hopefully once I start uh, with the academy, the um, the French is uh, up to speed. So yeah, and now now I realise how Sitovini Sivivatu got his certificate. I Man, I thought he would have taken over his <laughs> Fiji certificate, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's a head coach role. Something that you you know might, might tickle your fancy. You know, one day I know it's a long way away, but is it something that you've sort of thought about? At the moment, no, I don't. Uh, I don't think I could be a head coach or uh, <laughs> um, yeah. No, not at the moment. I, I kind of enjoy working with the, the future of the game, the younger players. And uh, as anyone who's been in the coaching uh, uh, coaching role knows, uh, the higher you get and the, the bigger the job is, it gets a lot more complicated. So at the moment, I'm I'm going to relish this new role with uh, the younger uh, players here at Toulouse. And, and uh, if it means that I could get a different role with the pro team uh, doing skills or doing little bits here and there then uh, I would love that but uh, definitely uh, head coach uh, out of the question at the moment and you got some I suppose you're an entrepreneur you got some mint wear underwear as well on the to, uh, on, the, on the side yeah tell us a bit, bit about that that the, your underwear range and sort of what um, you know inspired you to, to, to get into that <laughs> Oh yeah, we, uh, me and a couple of my uh, childhood mates, Bayon and Johnny, it just came up through. Uh, <clears throat> we always catch up, and obviously through uh, COVID and uh, lockdown, we, we were always having our weekly chat. We just thought we we needed to start something together, and we uh, we always we were always passionate about. Uh, uh, finding undies that, uh, <laughs> that that didn't give us wedgies, so <laughs> that would always find its way into our conversations, and uh, we we fell on uh, underwear, and and for us it wasn't just the, just about uh, making underwear and then and giving it up. It was more more about uh, what message we could uh, push with our underwear, and knowing um, we've known a lot of mates that. Uh, 
battled with uh, body confidence mm. or you know, self esteem issues and uh, and and also being a big topic in uh, in society at the moment is men's health. Then a lot of us just uh, joke about those kind of issues because because uh, that's what guys do. And, and for us, it was more pushing a message in terms of being vulnerable in terms of. Uh, your body confidence, your confidence within yourself, and how you how you could do that. And for us, through our undies, we wanted to push that message uh, to get guys being, uh, you know, or just having our undies being the starter of a conversation in terms of how how we can get men being more confident. Yeah, and that's that's what it is. I mean, you're not you're not talking underwear. That's just for you know yeah. Um, that, that's often related to um, sports people where they've got abs and things like that and, 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 mm. and, and, and modelling sort of aspirations. This is, you know, different sizes and, you know, you know obviously uh, with the multi-culture um, society that we have these days as well, sort of targeting that. So it's all different sizes and, like you say, um, you know, with, with, you know, getting guys to actually speak, that's a big part of what you've, you've got. You've always sort of pushed with, um, with, with some of these youngsters as well, eh? Yeah, and we we wanted to make it a point in terms of our marketing that we didn't want guys with six pack or eight pack abs uh, <laughs> and your your athletes uh, uh, modeling because we know that those athletes could easily uh, fit fit any any kind of underwear and we know that they're confident but we wanted everyday everyday people wearing ours uh, to be relatable to to everyone and hopefully that. Uh, um, you know, it, it just starts something and it triggers something within someone to be able to to feel confident about themselves. And we wanted our underwear to be the starting point of that. Oh, so good, so good. Um, I, I want to just go back quickly because I, you know, uh, in terms of the the rugby stuff, and there's a big game coming up this weekend. But in terms of what you've experienced uh, in, in France, do you, is there aspects over there in, in terms of the game and how they play the game that you think New Zealand rugby could? could actually take on board and, and learn from? Oof. Oh, I don't know. That's a tough one. I think it's hard because uh, it's a tough one because a lot of what uh, what they do here is uh, taken from what, uh, what uh, we see in the Southern Hemisphere or Super Rugby. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, it's uh, it's. I don't. If if the seasons were longer in uh, in New Zealand, then maybe in terms of structure of of squads turning around squads. But at the moment, I I couldn't find anything where New Zealand rugby could uh, um, or or the team Super Rugby teams could uh, learn from at the moment. Awesome. Uh, well, do you, have you been watching a bit of the uh, Super Rugby out there or the? Trans Tasman, I know they get the guys get it over in a pretty good time over there. So you're just waking up and every turning week. the TV on every week. All right, man. So yeah. what, what have you made of this Blues side over the, in the last few years? Because you know you kept in the Blues, um, you went through some tough times, you got into finals. Do you see similarities between Toulouse and what they're sort of building and this Blues team that, that are about to hit the grand final on on Saturday night? Yeah, I see. I see similarities in terms of uh, the younger players coming through. Uh, I just see that just uh, they just don't give a damn. They just want to get out there and play. Uh, they're not phased about any pressure, not phased about uh, making mistakes. They just want to go out there and express what they have, and uh, that's one similarity that I can compare to the younger boys that we have here in France. Uh, but yeah, to sit back and watch uh, the blue side go from strength to strength and uh, um, see them get the results uh, it's been amazing and uh, to see them build for the last couple of years it's uh, it's been incredible so uh, to see the uh, to get them uh, to see them get rewarded uh, and be in a final it's a home final as well it's amazing so give us your thoughts then bro where do you see it? where do you see them winning it and, and how, how much do you see them winning it by Blues at home. Is that Highlanders team, mate? Eh? By, by ten, that Highlanders team, mate. Eh? That that they can be a niggly side, eh? They come up here and they are the underdog card, and and they uh, and yeah. they go about it, right? Yeah, I know. Nuggy and his boys. Uh, Nuggy's playing incredible as well. He's playing some awesome footy, and, and uh, yeah, those are uh, uh, the Highlanders side. They're they're a tight team. 
they they work for each other. But I have uh, faith and belief in my Blues boys being at home. Uh, I'd go to the Blues by team. Oh, man, that's awesome, mate. It's pretty conservative coming from you, brother. But uh, I want to leave it at that because I know it's, uh, it's night time over there and we really appreciate your time coming on here. It's good to catch up with you. You're still looking young and fresh there, bro. Awesome to see you. <laughs> Thanks, Chef. 